Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar, Becoming an Anti-Racist Society, Setting a Developmental Research Agenda. I am Dr. Kelly Fisher, the Director for Policy at the Society for Research and Child Development. The recent events in the U.S. and more globally highlight the need for us to have a substantive and at times uncomfortable dialogue about racism and how we can do better as individual researchers, as a professional community, as funders of research, as publishers who choose what to publish and disseminate, as well as the broader community of stakeholders who use this evidence to inform policy and action. We have a wealth of data that shows the effects of individual and systemic racism on people of color and, in particular, on black lives. However, research is more limited on how racist beliefs and behaviors develop and how they are socialized in families, in public circles, and continue across generations in white communities. We also have limited evidence on ways to systematically disrupt racism. We need to do more. Developmental science has a critical role to play in fostering an anti-racist society. This webinar represents a call to action to our members and to the broader community. Today, we begin the dialogue of how to set a developmental research agenda spanning disciplines, theories, and methodologies. We begin this conversation with a panel of four experts who will share their insights and their experiences. During the last portion of this webinar, we invite you to ask questions. We will provide instructions on how to submit questions at the beginning of the Q&A session. We're also so very heartened to see so many viewers committing their time to this important conversation, and we realize we do not have time to cover the vast array of topics that can be included in the developmental research agenda. Today is only the beginning of this conversation, and we will be sharing some of the ways for all of us to continue this important dialogue at the end of the session. We will also be recording this webinar, which will be posted online next week. I now turn this webinar over to our first expert, Dr. Eleanor Seaton, who is an associate professor in the Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. Eleanor? Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, good afternoon. It may even be good evening, depending on where you are. I want to reiterate and welcome you to this session. Again, my name is Eleanor Seaton, and I initiated the reason for this webinar to exist. I'm a developmental psychologist and I study the impact of racism on black youth's overall development. I initiated this webinar out of frustration. After the George Floyd incident, I wondered to myself, what can be done? As someone who studies racism, I know all too well the negative effects of racism. The next day while I was running, this idea came to me. It is time to have a conversation among the people who have the most to do with eradicating racism, and that's white individuals. You may be wondering why there are not more scholars of color on this panel. And the simple reason is because they don't belong here. It is white people's job to eradicate racism. Racism was started, it is maintained, and it is perpetuated by white individuals, whether they know, agree, or even understand that fact. So it is not the job of non-whites to eradicate racism. It is the job of white individuals. And today, we are going to hear from two scholars who have undertaken this journey to become anti-racist, not only in their lives, but also in their research agenda. It is my hope that we model two things for all of our attendees. A, that we model the emotional labor that must be undertaken if one is to pursue an anti-racist research agenda. The emotional labor that involves critically unpacking white privilege, whiteness, and overall white supremacy before an anti-racist agenda can be undertaken. So we hope to model that behavior for white scholars to do. But before we do that, I'd like to have a minute of silence. I'd like to have a minute of silence for all the victims of COVID-19 around the world. As of this morning, there are over a half a million victims who have succumbed to COVID-19, and there are 10 million people who have been affected by COVID-19. I would also like to have a moment of silence for all the victims, recent and in the past, of who have died at the hands of police officers. Those individuals include, but are not limited to, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, Nina Pop, 
Tony McKay, and of course, Brianna Taylor. So we will have 60, minutes, 60 seconds of silence to honor those victims. Thank you for that. So I will be joined today by Margaret Cahey, a professor at the University of Georgia. I will be joined by Rebecca White, associate professor at Arizona State University, and Gabriella Leva Stein, an associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, will join us later for the Q&A. And so again, just to reiterate, this panel is primarily comprised of white individuals by design to emphasize whose job and sole responsibility it is to eradicate racism. Again, we want to model the behavior that we would like to see our white colleagues engage in. Now, on the next slide, I provided a definition of racism. I'm not going to read my long definition, but I wanna highlight key elements that are gonna drive our conversation from this definition, taken from Shelley Harrell's seminal 2000 paper. First and foremost, racism assist, is a system of dominance, power, and privilege. It is systemic. Also, it's rooted in the historical oppression of a group defined or perceived by dominant group members as inferior. And last but not least, it has the effect of leaving non-dominant group members excluded from power, esteem, status, and or equal access to societal resources. I wanted to start with the definition of racism because I think it's critically important for us to understand what racism is. There are a lot of conversations happening today about what racism is and is not and I wanted us to start off on the same foot as to what I mean when I talk about racism. On the next slide, you're going to see a picture. I was tasked with trying to find a visualization of racism, and I'll admit it was very difficult. It was very difficult to imagine one picture that would capture the impact of racism on non-whites globally. I decided to show you four little girls. Four little girls killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, which occurred on September 15, 1963. Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, Addie Mae Collins, and Carol Robertson. Four little girls preparing for church services. Killed by a bomb placed in their church by three members of the local Ku Klux Klan chapter. With the exception of Denise, who was 11 years old, the other three girls were 14, teenagers, adolescents, the population that I studied, four little girls. So what's the impact of racism on non-white non individuals? Um, well, first, it's pervasive and prevalent it starts early based on empirical research examining the experiences of ethnic racial minority children. There are multiple human perpetrators, peers, teachers, school administrators, law enforcement officers, unknown random adults, shopkeepers. It's linked with a plethora of negative outcomes, mental health, physical health, 
risky behaviors, academic outcomes, even allostatic load, which is now an indicator of accelerated aging. It increases with age. So as non-white children develop, they experience more racism-related experiences from diverse perpetrators. And last but not least, racism is multidimensional, multi-level, and it operates from the most micro levels of society all the way up to the macro levels of society. Racism is simply bad for non-whites. It kills, it steals, and it destroys, just like it did with these four little girls. On the next slide, I wanted to capture a picture of a type of racism. In the James Jones typology, he talks about individual racism. And I wanted to show this picture from a video that I found on Twitter. Now in this video, you see an older white woman bathed in a Confederate flag. And these are the words that she uttered in this video. I'll teach them to effing hate you all people. Too bad, too bad, too bad. I will teach my grandkids to hate you all. And the reason why I think this picture is relevant because it shows us three things about racism. It shows us that it is taught from parents or grandparents to kids. It is transmitted from grandparents or parents to kids. And it is socialized from grandparents or parents to kids. I'm not sure how well you can see this video, but in the background, you see three small children, white children, bathed also in a Confederate flag. And it forces us to acknowledge that this is not something that kids come here with. They are taught and socialized how to be racist. On the next slide, I chose a picture that I wanted to capture institutional racism, another type of racism talked about in James Jones typology. And I highly recommend his seminal book, Racism and Prejudice. And if for those who, are un who may not know what this refers to, this would be the infamous Amy Cooper. On Memorial Day weekend, right before we learned about the George Floyd video, Amy Cooper was walking her dog in Central Park, not on a leash, which is inconsistent with the rules of Central Park. She encountered Chris Cooper, no relation, an African-American male bird watcher. Chris Cooper told Amy Cooper to put her dog on a leash to ensure the safety of other people enjoying Central Park. Well, Amy Cooper became irate and threatened to call the police. And this is a snapshot of what she told the police on her cell phone. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I am being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. Well, we know that Amy lied because Chris Cooper recorded the entire interaction. Hence, this is taken from that video that circulated among all social media platforms. Well, why is this evidence of institutional racism? Amy Cooper used her whiteness and the power inherent in whiteness to weaponize a system, a law enforcement institution to bring harm to Chris Cooper. I wanna say that again. Amy Cooper used her whiteness to weaponize a societal institution, in this case, law enforcement, to weaponize against Chris Cooper to bring him harm and or possibly death. Our society is replete with white officers killing unarmed people of color. Now, this is instructive for a few reasons. One, it suggests people like Amy, white individuals, know the power that is inherent in their whiteness. It is not unknown. Amy Cooper knew exactly what she was doing, hence the outrage that it sparked. So there is an awareness of the power in whiteness given to it by racism. And two, the idea that any white person could weaponize their whiteness to bring harm to non-whites cannot be overstated. 
And hence, this is the power underlying whiteness and white privilege that is fueled by racism. And those are just two examples. Again, racism is multidimensional and multi-level. On the next slide, I present to you a definition of anti-racism. Again, I am not going to read the definition, but I wanna highlight critical parts of it. A critical understanding of racism and white privilege. Intentional and consistent behaviors that challenge racism. Serving as allies to people of color, teaching other white individuals about racism and white privilege. Now, I wish I could take credit for this definition, but I can't. I cobbled this from counseling psychology, sociology, ethnic and racial studies, specifically critical whiteness, to come up with this definition of anti-racism. And I like it because it alerts us to the underlying power element that must be addressed. I would argue that the most critical part of being anti-racist is this critical understanding of racism and white privilege. It is a journey that most white individuals must undertake if they truly want to be anti-racist. So I'm now gonna turn this over to Rebecca and Margaret who are gonna talk about their journey on this critical understanding of racism and white privilege. Okay, so um, thank you, Eleanor. Um, I wanna start by just thanking Eleanor for initiating this conversation and thanking Gabby and Margaret and SRCD for inviting me to be a part of it. I also need to acknowledge that I'm not an expert on becoming an anti-racist society or in the development of whiteness. I am a developmental researcher who studies adolescent development within neighborhood contexts that vary on their ethnic and racial concentrations. I am an educator who has mentored a growing number of colleagues and students along anti-racist journeys. I speak largely from these experiences. Eleanor asked me to share my personal narrative about becoming an anti-racist. I want to start by saying, is anybody else hearing those noises? I want to start by saying that I don't actually think of myself as an anti-racist. Instead, I think of myself as somebody on an anti-racist journey, as Eleanor mentioned, as someone who is working toward anti-racism racism in myself internally, in my family, and in my professional roles. I embrace the assumption that for whites in the US, this journey is a lifelong responsibility and that no matter how far along the journeys we think we are, we always have more work to do. That being said, I do look back on a few particular inflection points, if you will, that I think drew me further into this journey. And I'm gonna describe one to you today. And I think the best way that I can characterize this is to say that it was a day that I realized that I had race, that I experienced a social position in the United States racial hierarchy. For a substantial portion of my child, uh, adolescent and young adult life, I didn't really think of myself as white. I wanna be clear that I didn't think of myself as a member of some other racial group. Rather, when I learned about race in numerous conversations, both uh, undergrad, graduate, and in my community, the descriptions of white families I encountered in like, these courses and conversations were nothing like mine. The white families didn't experience poverty. They didn't experience homelessness. They always had running water, um, turned on electricity, enough food, and winter coats. So I felt like I knew that white families were out there and that they had numerous advantages, but that I didn't come from one of those families. At the time, I felt like white may have described the color of my skin, but it did not describe my life experiences. As an educator confronting whiteness in ASU classrooms, I frequently encounter similar narratives among first-generation white students. So I went through seven and a half years of undergrad took a lot of diversity courses, and eventually three years of a terminal master's program in public health, also taking diversity courses. And all along this time, I was feeling like I knew that I was white, but I wasn't like white, white. Eventually, I started taking classes in a doctoral program as a non-degree seeking student, and I enrolled in a family diversity course. In that course, for the first time that I can recall, 
I engaged with diversity scholarship that advanced definitions and frames that treated racial privilege as a construct that was distinct from socioeconomic privilege. This distinction was essential to my being able to recognize and see that whiteness did not just describe the color of my skin. It actually influenced my life experiences. I recall doing my weekly course readings one Saturday afternoon, and something just clicked as I was doing this set of reading. And I wrote in the margins of a John Ogbu article, not one that I necessarily recommend reading for this journey, but I remember writing, I'm white, and then parenthetically, like white, white. For me, I look back on this moment of the acceptance and the seeing my whiteness, and, and which was essential to seeing its specific privileges as key to facilitating my engagement with an anti-racist journey. I want to be sure to say, however, um, that it was critical for me to see whiteness and accept whiteness as a defining feature of my life, but that that was never enough and is never going to be. Thus, it may have been an inflection point for me, but to have stopped there or to suggest that getting there is enough would be irresponsible. With that, I'll pass it on to Margaret. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I'd also like to thank SRCD for sponsoring this webinar and also thanking Eleanor for um, helping us to start this journey. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a professor at the University of Georgia and my research, uh, my training background is in public health and human development. My research focuses on the development of ethnic minority children in the context of their families and communities and with a particular focus on the correlates of academic achievement and behavioral development. I think my personal story is a lot less straightforward than Rebecca's. I don't know that I had a moment when it dawned on me that I was white. I think about a question that Eleanor asked me a couple of years ago. She asked me, well, how did you end up, how, are, how did you become an anti-racist? And um, it made me think about it, and I wasn't sure I knew what the answer to the question was. Um, and I wasn't entirely sure I was an anti-racist. I was raised in a large Catholic family in Texas. I have six brothers and sisters, and my parents are both academics. When Eleanor asked me this question about how I became an anti-racist, I tried to think back to my childhood and when did I first hear about race, and I don't really, didn't, don't really remember anything in particular. I don't remember my parents talking to me about race. I'm sure they must have socialized me um, about race in terms of in the ways of the things that they talked about, the way that they uh, interacted with people of color. Um, and I'm sure I was socialized in all the contexts that I was raised. I was raised in a predominantly white neighborhood. I went to predominantly white schools until I got to high school. So then, as I mentioned, my research program is primarily focused on the development of ethnic minority children. Um, but if I was to go back to the early and mid 1990s when I got out of graduate school, uh, it, that was not really an intentional choice on my part to pursue that research. It was somewhat serendipitous, just coincidental. I was working in the community evaluation of the Healthy Start Project in Baltimore, which was in a predominantly black neighborhood in Baltimore. Um, there were funding opportunities around ethnic minority child development, and I also had some new collaborations with black scholars such as Suzanne Randolph. And so those things kind of came together and I found myself on this journey of, of doing research on um, ethnic minority kids. But if I'm to be perfectly honest, I'd say I've always been very self-conscious of the fact that I'm a white woman doing research on black and brown children. And so I, and I don't think that that self-consciousness is necessarily a bad thing it, because it did keep me aware of my whiteness. I think uh, in terms of thinking of an, uh, inflection points, probably the next inflection point for me was in 2005 around Hurricane Katrina. So at that time I was at the University of Texas School of Public Health and every year I would give a lecture to medical students on social determinants of health. And so I had lots of charts and lots of statistics and I had information about how race is a social construct and I've been doing that every year probably for five or six years at that point. And that year in 2005, my lecture on social inequalities just happened to be about two or three days after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. And I found myself really unable to engage in the usual lecture that I did in terms of just showing statistics. It didn't seem to capture what was really going on. So instead, what I did was to read a, um, 
an editorial that had come across the listserv for um, for uh, the Social Justice Caucus for the American Public Health Association on systemic racism in health. And so I read that to the students and at just opened up a discussion for the entire class period about how, how things could be changed. And I remember being feeling very strongly at that time that I needed to be actively anti-racist, that I needed to actively combat racism. So when Eleanor asked me this question a few years ago, it made me think about have I actually been anti-racist? Um, was I really actively combating racism in my academic life as well as in my personal life? Because I think it's very easy for white people to get complacent. So just to give you an example, I mean, I think this is a constant struggle and I don't always get it right. But a few weeks ago, I had a, uh, a manuscript, a paper, a journal submission that was rejected. And that's not a new experience. I get lots of papers rejected. But when I got the reviews, I noticed that several of the criticisms was that the paper was written through a deficit lens. And I was just devastated because it had never been my intention to write a paper that was through a deficit lens. But when I went back and I read the paper and I could see, yeah, they, the reviewers had a point. And I think what it reminded me is that um, we have to be intentional in everything that we do in, in both of our personal life and our professional life, that it's never done. And we have to keep it kind of in our forefront if we're really going to combat uh, racism. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Rebecca, who's gonna talk about how racism does not show up in developmental science with white youth. Thank you, Margaret. I wanna thank Margaret for sharing her story. I wanna recognize that there is diversity in these stories and in these journeys. And I wanna invite viewers to continue to explore their own journeys. I also wanna point out, as it happens, that racism and racial, racial privilege and anti-racism were clearly showing up in my life and in Margaret's life during periods relevant to child development researchers. So how or why are these constructs not consistently showing up in developmental research with white youth? I'm going to share a few ways that racism is failing to show up in developmental research, especially that with white youth. These are not really mutually exclusive. In fact, they work together to maintain racism in SRCD, in our fields, and in the U.S. Remember, as Eleanor said, an anti-racist Anti-racism requires an active anti-racist practice. Therefore, an anti-racist research agenda, like the one Margaret's gonna talk about later, requires an active anti-racist research practice. If we ignore racism, and we are ignoring knowledge gained about racism from research with non-white youth and conducted by black, indigenous, and people of color, then we are not practicing anti-racism. One of the ways that racism is held up in developmental research involves reification of Eurocentrism and colorblindness. Eurocentrism involves looking at white youth's development as development and as the norm in development. It also is the idea that white youth development is race neutral development. Colorblindness, according to Neville and colleagues, involves denying racial differences by emphasizing sameness and are denying racism by emphasizing equal opportunities. So how do Eurocentrism and colorblindness manifest in, in our work? I'll give a few just small examples. They manifest in how we talk about research with white youth or predominantly white youth. In publications with these samples, we often call it child development. We only name or expect researchers to name the group they are studying when we study development among non-white youth. This is whiteness as default, as good, as normative, as desirable, as race neutral, and as some kind of truth. This is one of the ways we maintain racism. Colorblindness and Eurocentrism manifest when we critique an ethnic or racial homogenous research design for not having a white comparison group. Again, whiteness is default, as normative, as standard, as race neutral. This is one of the ways we maintain and uphold racism. And this is one of several ways that developmental scientists have pushed back against empirical evidence of racism as experienced by black, indigenous, and youth of color. We have scientific evidence of Eurocentrism and colorblindness operating in our fields. In 2019, De Jesus and colleagues found that 73% of articles published in psychology journals in 2015-16 never mentioned the race of their research participants. Roberts and colleagues in a 2020 meta-analysis queried leading psychology journals in three de developmental, 
social and mm, cognitive. And they looked at two top tier journals in each of those divisions and whether or not empirical articles made explicit reference to race in the title or abstract from 1970 to 2010. By explicit reference, this could range from anything from saying, describing the, the, the race of the sample, the sample is white, for example, to actual study of racism related constructs. Um, two journals represented developmental, including our very own child development and developmental psychology. In these two journals across these decades, we went from having 5% of articles explicitly mentioning race in the title, abstract or abstract or both, to 12. This trend is symptomatic of the act of not naming race in research with white youth. It is symptomatic of the active exclusion and undervaluation of research on youth of color by our societies and it is symptomatic of colorblindness. So under Eurocentric and colorblind ideology, if we cannot even name race in describing research samples, how can we begin to ask racism-informed questions about white youth development? And these ideologies allow us to claim an imagined racial innocence centered in our experience of being white. Thus, whiteness limits the research questions we ask about youth in general and about white youth specifically. We white researchers are disinclined to ask anti-racist research questions or to theorize white children's development in the context of race because we see ourselves as race neutral. Additionally, because of these ideologies, we have ignored what research with black, indigenous, and people of color has taught us about white youth, including that white youth develop racist beliefs and attitudes and presumably can develop anti-racist beliefs and attitudes. Thus, researchers studying predominantly white youth or studying diverse youth from a colorblind perspective are not held accountable by themselves or by our field for knowing about research with youth of color or incorporating knowledge gained from developmental research with youth of color into our developmental frames. If I study cognitive, social, emotional development in neighborhoods, schools, peer groups, but I am only held accountable for knowing the research conducted with predominantly white samples, then I have a very narrow understanding of my particular developmental phenomena. The idea that knowledge gained from research with white youth or from colorblind research with diverse youth is all that most developmental researchers are responsible for knowing to advance their work, to advance their introduction sections, is maintains racism in the developmental sciences. So, Colorblind ideology, Eurocentric ideology, ignoring researches, research with uh, black, indigenous, and youth of color, not holding ourselves accountable or responsible for incorporating knowledge gained from research with youth of color into understanding of child development are some of the reasons why we are not, race is not showing up in research with white youth. Margaret? Thank you so much, Rebecca. So what would an anti-racist research agenda in developmental science look like? I'd like to recall the definition of racism that Eleanor shared with us and some of the key elements of that, which focus on power, privilege, and the dominance of one group over other groups. Now there is a ro robust research on the development of stereotypes and bias in children. But that re research rarely, if ever, acknowledges the power element. And this power element alters the nature and meaning of these developmental constructs for white youth and their consequences for non-white youth. Because of the power element, what we're talking about in white youth is racism, not just bias or prejudice. And we need more basic research in the development of racism, as well as anti-racist attitudes in white youth. Now, this is going to require collaboration across different disciplinary traditions within developmental science and also with disciplines outside of developmental science. So, for example, there's a literature on identity development in children of color. This research could inform research on how white children develop an understanding of their white identity and the power and privilege that accompanies that identity. Another example is cognitive psychology research on the development of bias and stereotypes in children. This research could be extended to explicitly examine whiteness and the power within of whiteness. Outside of our discipline, we could draw um, input from the field of sociology. So for example, there are qualitative data published by Van Osdale and Fegan 
that demonstrates that white children as young as the age of three or four not only understand distinctions between racial groups, but also power that's associated with being white, and that their understanding of that power shapes their interactions with children of, color, of other ethnic groups. However, it's important to remember that research on racism is distinct from research on anti-racism. In the definition that Eleanor shared us on anti-racism, some of the key elements are the intentional and consistent behaviors that challenge racism. So we need a separate line of research on how anti-racist attitudes and behavior develop in white youth. We need basic research on how, among uh, the development of white identity among white youth and the development of racism and anti-racist attitudes and behavior. So for example, how do white youth come to understand their whiteness and the power that comes from whiteness? We need more uh, information on the normative development across ages of attitudes and behaviors and the processes that undergird that development. We need information on the individual differences in the development of these attitudes and behaviors. So for example, are there family characteristics, school factors, or community factors that contribute to the development of anti-racist attitudes and behaviors? How, uh, we need to know more about the demographic characteristics of the context in which white youth develop. For example, what about the proportion of white residents in a neighborhood or the proportion of white students in a school? How do these factors shape a child's developing identity and understanding of whiteness? We need to know more about the processes within these contexts. So for example, interactions with parents, interactions with teachers, or interactions with peers that increase or decrease the likelihood that white youth will engage in anti-racist behaviors. Expanding developmental science in these directions is going to require utilizing a broad range of methods, including qualitative methods, quantitative methods, and mixed methods. We can also build upon the methods of other domains of developmental science, such as socialization research, cognitive development, peer research, and identity development research. The ultimate goal is to develop interventions and policies to reduce racism and to increase anti-racism among white youth. So while there are interventions to reduce bias and prejudice, these interventions don't address the power issue. And indeed, to extend that, addressing the reduction of racism is not the same thing as addressing increasing anti-racism. So up to this point, I've been focused primarily on developing research in, on anti-racist attitudes and behaviors. But it's important to note that all developmental scientists can contribute to anti-racism in developmental science. They are characteristics of how developmental science is conducted, how it's funded, who's conducting it, and how it's disseminated that functions to limit the development of anti-racist efforts. Rebecca discussed some of these issues, and especially those factors that render whiteness invisible and reify a white Eurocentric view of what is considered normative or optimal. So all developmental scientists have a role to play in dismantling these structures and promoting an anti-racism research agenda in developmental science. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Rebecca, who's going to discuss some of the factors that should be considered by white researchers who are interested in, advanc in advancing an anti-racism agenda in developmental science. Thank you, Margaret. So we are ultimately hopeful that after attending this webinar and engaging with us in discussion, that you are interested in taking steps that help you to advance along your own anti-racist journeys and help our professional societies advance an anti-racist research agenda, either directly by engaging in such research or indirectly through service, for example, as reviewers, editors, committee members, to SRCD and related institutions. It is important, however, that we take certain steps as white scholars to make sure that we are prepared for this work. The preparation is going to require both emotional and intellectual labor. One of the first things that I think we need to do is to develop humility. We need to have the humility to recognize that we do not know as much as we think we know. We need to have the humility to unlearn old ways of thinking and to learn one new to us, but not new. We need to have the humility to mess up, make mistakes, apologize, and keep engaging in the work. The humility to say, I have contributed to maintaining racism in SRCD and beyond, and no matter how far I go in my anti-racist journey, 
I am almost certainly going to willingly or unwillingly prioritize whiteness in the future. We also need to develop vigilance with each study we design, with each article, grant, proposal, or tenure packet we review. We need to maintain a vigilant watch for how our white lens is impacting our work. We need to be vigilant in our search of knowledge, both about our developmental topic areas and, and about ourselves and our histories. We need to be vigilant in our practice of seeking out that knowledge, creating time to engage with that knowledge, and maintaining and nurturing that knowledge. I would argue that though white researchers certainly have a responsibility to engage in anti-racism and to support the development of an anti-racist research agenda, they also need to be suspicious of reproducing racism by creating all white spaces to do this work. Tim Creighton, an educator I recommend, says that when whiteness is centered in, in excuse me, when whiteness is centered, it stays in the shallow end of improving diversity and inclusion. Whiteness is always in the way. Thus, an all white research team, even one who has done the work of advancing along the anti-racist journey, always runs the risk of reproducing or reinforcing racism. Part of addressing this risk is about doing the work involving humility and vigilance to stay on and advance your anti-racist journeys. But an important part is also that the research will benefit from the expertise, the paid and institutionally recognized expertise of black, indigenous, and people of color who are experts in racism, settler colonialism, and other topics, and, and that they want to and can bring to bear their expertise on the development of white youth. Similarly, because I know this work is also emerging for people of color who want to engage in research on anti-blackness. It will be important to engage with and recognize the work of black scholars with expertise on racism. Finally, and I just wanna acknowledge that some folks are going to get frustrated with me because some of this is gonna sound like a conflicting recommendation. White scholars need to identify places that they can unpack their whiteness the lack of knowing and some of the ignorance that goes along with being allowed to exist in the world without, without race. They need to be able to unpack that where they will not do continued harm to their black, indigenous, and people of color colleagues. Unpacking white ignorance equals black and indigenous trauma. So find a space to do the work that does not burden your black, indigenous, and colleagues of color in the process. We'll talk more about these spaces and related resources later. For now, I'm gonna send it back to Margaret for advice for funders. So we wanted to take a part of this uh, webinar to speak directly to funders because we all know that funding opportunities have a lot of influence on what research gets done. And there are a lot of ways that funders can support this work. I think one of the most important ways is for funders to consider how they can support research specifically focused on normative development of children of color, because there have been long-standing structural issues in the funding and review process that continue to be significant hindrances to advancing research on children of color. And this involves an, a critical examination of how grant review panels are formed and how they function. Specifically related to anti-racism, research, funders should consider issuing special calls. This, these special calls should recognize the early stage of this research because it will be exploratory, it will be developmental, it will be focused on measurement development. So all of that needs to be reflected in the type of, of special calls that a funder might issue. It also should require the inclusion of ethnically diverse research teams as uh, Rebecca very um, eloquently shared that so for off, so often, so for so long, whiteness has been invisible in developmental science, and it really is the responsibility of white researchers to render it visible. However, we don't think that that can happen effectively if the voices of scholars of color aren't present at the table. 
In terms of the different types of funding, it's likely that foundation funding may be the most reliable source for stimulating some of this research because foundation funding tends to be the most flexible in how they can structure funding opportunities. Foundations can also be more nimble than federal funding sources in the development and release of funding calls. However, that doesn't mean that federal funding sources can't also play an important role. Now, I'm more familiar with NIH funding, so I'm going to focus my comments on NIH specifically. There are some lesser well-known funding mechanisms through NIH that could be used to support this work. I'm thinking specifically about a mechanism called a U13, which is globally labeled as a support of scientific conference. And a few years ago, I was part of a review panel for NICHD in which NICHD had coupled, they had created a, a, a funding opportunity that coupled a U13 with a limited competition R03 to support academic community partnerships that were engaged in community-based participatory research to um, address health inequality. And so the U13 component of it could last from one to three years, and each year was about $30,000 in funding, which allowed the development and, and extension of academic and community partnerships and allowed these partnerships the space to plan these uh, community-based programs, and then they could apply for this limited competition R03 that would provide the opportunity to pilot the intervention in the community. And it was considered a limited competition R03 because only those people who had the U13 could apply for the R03. So I could see a similar approach for um, efforts to stimulate anti-racism research. You could have a U13 that could help to stimulate the development of interdisciplinary uh, research teams, and then they could then develop their uh, their measures and a plan for a project that they would then apply for an R03 that would help them to collect preliminary data to be used to support a larger R01 funded project. Another NIH mechanism that would be very important is the K24, which is a career development program for mid-career scholars. So it's you may be more familiar with like the K01 or the K23, which is for junior scholars, but the K24 is for mid-career scholars. And because there are virtually no researchers working in this area now, a K24 mechanism could be an important way of giving more senior scholars the space that they need to expand their skills so that they could extend into this new research area. Now, just as individual researchers need to engage in self-reflection and emotional labor, so must funders examine the structures of the funding process in the same way. So, for example, careful consideration must be given to the composition of re review panels that evaluate proposals. The composition of NIH review uh, panels tends to lean toward researchers who do not display an appreciation for the research methods that would be critical for advancing anti-racism research. So we need reviewers that value, that understand the value of within-group study for developmental science. We need reviewers who understand the importance of diverse methodological approaches to advancing developmental science. Only by integrating these into the review process are we, will we be successful in advancing an anti-racist research agenda in developmental science. And with that, I would like to welcome Gabby Stein, who is my co-chair for SRCD's Ethnic Racial Issues, or ERI Committee, for a discussion of action steps for advancing an anti-racism research agenda in developmental science. Gabby? I don't know if I'll see her or not. So we really see this webinar as a starting point to a, a variety of different efforts that SRCD is undertaking to, to extend this. So this is really the beginning, not the be all and end all. One of the things that we are doing is as the SRCD ERI committee is that we are establishing a working group underneath ERI that we are referring to as the anti-racist white working group. And that will be headed by myself and Rebecca White, and that hopefully that will be a space where white researchers can start uh, uh, undertaking some of these this critical work. Um, the other is the SRCD Commons, and um, I believe, Gabby, you were going to talk more about the Commons? I am. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for SRCD for um, this webinar today and to our panelists. Um, so at ERI, we've been hard at work at sort of these issues around anti-racism for a while, um, and we want to continue these conversations. So SRCD Commons is going to be a place where we have started some threads where you can post resources and engage in discussion boards so that we can continue this conversation, because as Margaret said, this, this is just the initiation of these conversations. We want these to continue. 
We also, um, Eleanor has put together a wonderful uh, list of resources, not only for the own, your own emotional labor that may need to happen and to learn more about how to become an anti-racist, but also some scholarly resources as well that could be useful. And all of the panelists have agreed to be part of, uh, to be live on SRCD Commons at two different time points that you can see there, where we will be there to answer questions and engage in more dialogue. I know that there's lots of comments and questions in the comment box now, and unfortunately we will not be able to address all of them today. So this is the best space for you to continue this dialogue because I think it's critical as we move forward. I want to acknowledge the work that many black, indigenous, and people of color are also doing in our society to be anti-racist and to be an, and to continue this anti-racist research agenda. But again, we cannot do this alone. We need white allies to continue this work with us. We also want to acknowledge that anti-blackness is, is pervasive in other communities of color, and these conversations will need to continue um, within our society um, to move us all forward. Now, I want to say that our next webinar, so this is just the start of a conversation, and at ERI, we're hoping to do, develop a few webinars that are going to be on this topic, and we already have our next webinar starting to be planned that we hope to have in the next couple months, and this will be one about how to support the um, become a research ally so that we can support the work of black, indigenous, and people of color and their scholarly endeavors. So what are the things that we can all do as a society to support that work? So on that front, I know that there's been a lot of questions. Um, and so we're going to move to, to that portion of the webinar um, and hopefully engage in a lively discussion with you all. So I know people have been posting questions throughout and we've been monitoring them. Um, but in case you don't know how, here's how you can go ahead and do it. So I want to start with some questions that people had already submitted prior to the webinar today. So we received a lot of questions about anti-bias training and interventions. Is there research already done that tells us about bias training and awareness and how that changes an individual's behavior? Eleanor, how do you see an anti-racist research agenda fitting in with this research and approach? Uh, thank you, Gabby. And again, I want to thank Rebecca and Margaret for their eloquent uh, discussion of their journeys, but also thinking carefully about what this research agenda will look like in developmental science. So before I answer that question, let me back up and again talk about the difference between bias, prejudice, and racism. Margaret touched on it, but um, I think it's appropriate, it's important to use appropriate language when we're talking about white youth. And that language is racism. Prejudice doesn't have a power element. So non-white individuals can be racially prejudicial. White individuals, however, can be racist because racism is prejudice plus power. Now that is crucially important because it means what I refer back to with Amy Cooper. At any point in time, any white person can use their whiteness to weaponize institutions against non-whites. As Margaret pointed out, white kids as young as three or four understand the power tied to their whiteness. So if we're going to start an anti-racist research agenda, it's very important to think about what the phenomena is for white youth, and that's racism, so we can capture that power element. Um, the second reason I wanna talk about the, the, re the second discussion for why we should use racism as opposed to prejudice or bias is to be consistent with our colleagues, not just in sociology or counseling psychology or even ethnic and racial studies, critical whiteness, but is to be consistent with the legal field. When lawsuits are formed on the basis of race or ethnicity, lawyers use racism and racial discrimination. That's it. Um, similarly, if we think about the United Nations, the United Nations uses the word racism. At the beginning of the June, the Human Rights Commissioner at the UN released a declaration condemning systemic racism in the United States based on what happened with George Floyd. And last but not least, and I think this is also critically important, last year, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, released a statement arguing that they were going to pursue domestic terrorism equally to international terrorism. They define the greatest threat to the U.S. as coming from the alt-right or right-wing extremists. And I want to use their, I want to quote them directly. 
They argue that they were investigating racially motivated extremists who are fueled by white supremacy. Now we could have another conversation about racism and white supremacy, but the point that I wanna make is that the FBI is using the appropriate language to capture what the phenomenon that we're talking about, which is fueled by racism. So I think as developmental scientists, we need to do likewise. We need to join our colleagues in counseling psychology, sociology, critical whiteness, ethnic and racial studies, our legal colleagues in this country and around the world, particularly those working at the United Nations. And more importantly, we need to join with the efforts of the FBI, who is now trying to counter violent extremist uh, ideologies motivated by racism and white supremacy. So the correct word is racism. Now, to answer your question, um, I did a lit search and I only found two review papers that review interventions for bias or prejudice. One of the reviews was, was looking at interventions designed for young kids and the other was more open. Um, the one for young kids was very interesting. They found that the interventions were more likely to impact attitudes rather than peer relationships or peer behaviors. They also found that the intervention was more effective with white, with majority dominant youth rather than ethnic minority youth. And the other review of interventions was inconclusive. They stated succinctly that many of the interventions were ineffective. So they could not conclude an overall effect size. What I want to point out, though, is none of these, none of the studies reviewed specifically targeted white youth and the reduction or eradication of racism. So again, if we want to think about interventions, we have to have the science that actually demonstrates what that looks like. Long answer to your question. Thanks, Eleanor. We also um, received a lot of questions about negotiating these conversations with colleagues. For example, someone asked, how do we start a conversation and educate ourselves on whiteness and Eurocentrism and not to burden our friends of color with our questions, especially during stressful times? Rebecca, what are your thoughts on this question? Thanks, Gabby. Um, I think it's really, so one of the things that, some of the strategies that I use, is that because of me? Are you guys hearing the echo? Yeah, okay. Um, there's a couple of strategies that I use, um, all of which I've tried to develop over time, some of which I've messed up repeatedly. Um, but I think one of the things is we need to be willing to do the work. I'm going to give you an example of a time where I almost didn't do the work, and then I really saw how it could pan out. I was serving on a um, hiring committee, and the committee um, was majority white um, with uh, two people of color on the committee. And we were discussing um, diversity statements. And um, my African-American colleague on the committee uh, pointed out that he was very concerned about some of the diversity statements. And I listened to him and I thought, hmm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm seeing what he's seeing. And so I said, um, could you give us an example? And he gave some examples. And I, I started to ask for more, but I just said to myself, no, I need to re-educate myself. I need to go back and read these diversity statements. And, and so um, at the end of the meeting, he said, look, if you really want to see this, read diversity statement one next to diversity statement two, and you'll, you guys will figure this out. So I, you know, I was tempted to stop at the end of the meeting and be like, hey, could you walk me through this? Could you, could you kind of like put me on, on the platter that whiteness has given me and, 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 and make that, me ride that nice uh, you know, carpet ride? Um, and, and, and pave this out for me. Um, but that would have been burdening him to educate me. Um, he's already invested in educating me by bringing this issue up in the committee. And so instead of asking him to do that, instead of emailing him and saying, oh, I didn't really understand what you were saying in the meeting, I went back and I did the homework assignment. I read the, I read the statements right next to each other and I saw that he said you would be able to see it if you did it like this. And I really did see it, but it did take me going back and rereading the statements and trying to look at them through a different lens. So I think part of not burdening our colleagues of color is doing the actual work, educating ourselves, taking those little investments that many of them make in us daily, 
and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to allow myself to benefit from that investment and take it to the next level. So that's the kind of work that we need to do. The other thing that we need to do is we need to really process and get to terms with the idea that when we're processing this, there is a very good chance that our processing is doing active harm to our colleagues of color. That I don't understand why I need to, you know, like I remember being in a training one day and um, on how to be more inclusive in our uh, curricular material. And, you know, um, a white colleague said, so what am I supposed to do? Have a picture of somebody from every single group in my slide presentation? And I just remember thinking, oh, all the harm that's happening in this room right now to, 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 to be processing that and, and out loud and in front of our colleagues of color and feel like that just was an unreasonable expectation. Like she needed a space where she could come, for example, to me and say, Rebecca, I don't understand. And I could say, well, here's how you learn to understand. Um, and so I think we need to be really cognizant of um, that our processing um, can be very harmful um, and, and um, tra traumatic um, and that we need to create spaces where we can do that without, with less harm. Great. Thank you, Rebecca, um, for sharing that, this, uh, your insights on that. We also received several questions about conducting research with samples that are diverse on race and ethnicity, about using racial variables as covariates rather than as central research questions, analyzing group differences, and or addressing small subsamples. Relatedly, people wanted to know if you use race as a covariate without a reference to racism, is that appropriate? So I'm going to ask Margaret to speak about this and sort of what this means in an anti-racist research agenda. Thanks so much, Gabby. Um, I want, uh, this is probably a much broader set of questions that I can really address adequately here. So before I start, I want to give a shout out to an edited volume that Gabby and Don Witherspoon have that's going to be forthcoming that builds off of a pre-conference that SRCD had back in 2019. So look for that sometime in 2021 because I think it gets into a lot of these issues um, in more depth. So I'll just kind of just answer some of them uh, in more of a, a brief way. The issue of race as a covariate and also analyzing group differences, I think by and large, I would, rec I would recommend against just using race ethnicity as a covariate, unless you have some sort of theoretical reason for why it's in there. I mean, the tendency is just to kind of plop it in there because you can without any consideration for what it means. And if you don't theorize about what it means, then your readers are gonna theorize what it means and um, it's kind of it tends to be a what I call a variance catcher. It just kind of grabber. It just grabs a lot of variance. And so it's best to think about theoretically what do you think might be the differences, and then actually include variables that measure measure those things. Um, I also think that there's a difference between um, comparing average levels of outcomes or independent variables or whatever between race ethnic groups and comparing differences in processes. And I have much less problem with the latter. So how does how do these family level factors contribute to behavioral development in this group? What's the how does what does the process look like in this group versus the process, how the process looks in another group? I see that as less problematic. It, when you do compare groups and you're just looking at mean differences, it then presumes that there's one group that's better than the other. And I don't think that that's really informative. The issue of process difference can be very informative. Um, and then finally about the issue of small subsamples. Um, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that there's no way that you're gonna, ever, you know, you're gonna be able to have a sample that addresses all the potential subgroups. You know, depending upon where you are, where your subsample comes from, you know, it may be that, you know, your sample is going to, because the context you're in is going to be, you know, predominantly white. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think the important thing is to contextualize your sample. So for so long, I mean, most individuals who do research with ethnic minority samples, we contextualize our sample, both in terms of family characteristics and where they come from and that sort of a thing. And uh, people dealing with predominantly white samples don't contextualize those samples. And if, I think that if they did, that would go a lot, uh, would go a long way in resolving some of these issues. The one person whose research I think about in this regard is the research of Sunya Luthar. Uh, 
who did some fascinating research looking at drug abuse among affluent white um, suburban adolescents and how they were at greater risk because some of the stressors that were on them. And so to me, that's an example of how you can have a white sample and you can still contextualize it in a way that, that, that is meaningful. Thanks, Margaret. So Eleanor, we have another question that I think you might want to tackle. And one question came from the, a set of people are wondering, what is the difference between racism and sexism? And how does that fit in in terms of an anti-racist research agenda? Um, great question. These are great questions. Um, so first of all, I subscribe to intersectionality, a perspective that originates in black feminist scholars, people like Patricia Hill Collins or Kimberly Crenshaw who is a lawyer, Patricia Hill Collins is a sociologist who further advanced intersectionality. And the idea behind intersectionality is that systems of oppression are not independent. They intersect and they create unique and different forms of oppression. So racism is not distinct from sexism, which is not distinct from classism, which is not distinct from homophobia or transphobia or ageism or ableism. All of these systems of oppression intersect and create unique forms of oppression for people based on their social positions. Now, what does that mean? That means, for example, that my experiences as a black woman, woman, while they may be similar to the experiences of a black man, because of that intersection of racism and sexism, I'm going to have unique experiences at the intersection of racism and sexism. So I would not recommend thinking about them as separate but thinking about them as intersecting systems of oppression and then identifying what are the experiences that arise for people based on that social location. So I gave an example of how my experiences will vary from that of a black man. My experiences as a black woman will also vary, vary from a Latina woman, an Asian American woman, a Native American woman. Now, in theory, all of us are at the intersection of racism and sexism. We're all women. We're all women of color. However, the history in this country of these groups vary. So again, my experiences as a Black woman will not be the same as the experience as a Native American woman or an Asian woman or a Latina. So I think it's very important to think about overarching systems of oppression, how they intersect, and how history plays a role in these unique forms of oppression. Um, and I would highly recommend, again, perusing intersectionality. Again, originated in Black feminist scholarship, and Black women have truly advanced intersectionality, particularly in legal circles and now in social sciences, um, so we can understand what this looks like when we start talking about multiple systems of oppression. Great. Thanks, Eleanor. Rebecca, I have a, the next question comes to you. Um, and it's a, also a sort of a clarifying question, which is that we have a lot of research that we're talking about about racism, prejudice, and bias. And how is that different or distinct or similar to making all research anti-racist? So how do we take a stab at making all research anti-racist versus research on these specific processes? Thanks, Gabby. Great question. Um, and a hard one. I'll, I'll buy myself some time, but I just want to build on something that Eleanor said, and as a white woman, I think I have a unique position to do this. Um, I also want to point out for the audience, especially my white colleagues, we often deflect away from racism, by, uh, especially white women, by, by uh, emphasizing sexism. So that's some of the work. So Eleanor is right about intersectional perspectives and how important they are to advancing this conversation. But the other end of that conversation is also that's some of the work that we as white women need to do to not deflect away from racism by, by highlighting and emphasizing sexism. So, um, so I actually have struggled with the, the question uh, a lot about like, how do we make all work anti-racist? Um, and, uh, and, you know, moving beyond, you know, I think it's important, to, as Eleanor said and um, Margaret said, to move beyond the study of prejudice and bias and to actually study the power element. Um, I think research on prejudice and bias may be able to inform some of our research questions or maybe a starting point, but that we need to advance beyond that. But I think there's a way that we can make our um, scholarship um, anti-racist, even if we're not doing some of that work. One thing is in our service to our organizations as reviewers um, and on committee members. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention about the Roberts study, for example, is that 
Um, when you put a person of color on an editorial board, um, it's a, or as an editor, like Cynthia Garcia Cole, for example, um, the, the equation changes drastically about how much research is published that mentions race, even just in passing. Um, and in fact, that study made specific reference to uh, the editorial position that Cynthia was really the lead on contextualizing our samples and recognizing what our samples look like. I think one small training thing that we could do to engage in anti-racist scholarship that would not even be a massive change to what we're doing is simply when we are studying white youth to say it. Your networks among white youth. Um, you know, uh, the, the impact of neighborhood environment on white youth. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're publishing these studies, but we're just saying how neighborhoods affect youth. And instead of saying, oh no, what we studied was how neighborhoods affect white youth. Or I don't, you know, a colorblind study of how neighborhoods affect diverse youth. I mean, we need to, we need to own this. And, um, you know, I hear as an, as an AE, I, I hear, I don't have room in my title to put all this stuff you want. And I'm like, scholars of color have been having to put all this stuff in their titles for decades. Uh, you can figure it out, I think. And so I think these are small changes. Why are you asking for a white comparison group? Why does it bother you when you're reviewing research that there's not a white comparison group or when you're serving on a panel? I have to be honest. Sometimes I hear these stories and I'm sh I thought, oh, we're still saying that? We're still saying you need a white comparison group? And the truth is we are. We said it yesterday and we're probably going to say it today. So I think that, we, you know, we just have to engage and we have to be honest with ourselves about what we are and what we are not studying. When we're studying white youth, name it. Thank you, Rebecca. You did a great job answering that. <laughs> um, we, uh, Margaret, the next question is for you. Um, someone sort of asked, what did you mean by a deficit lens? And what, how, did, what, how does that come in in an anti-racist racist research agenda? So um, great question. And I, I can, I'm going to answer it specifically from my own uh, research perspective. So I have a longitudinal study uh, that's comprised of African-American and, and Latinx youth that we've been following since the children were two and a half. And when we selected, when we recruited the sample, the sample, um, the family had to have a household income below 200 percent of the federal poverty level. So um, these are all families that experience um, low income and then they experience all the risk factors that come with low income. And, and I think that, you know, when you're working with samples like this, it's, and this is hard because I mean, I've been doing this for God, I'm coming up on 30 years, the language that we use um, can suggest that it, that in a way that risk factors define the individuals that you're, you're, um, you're studying. So for example, if you, refer to, you know, low income children. So the children aren't low income. They, they experience it, the, the characteristics of low income. But if you're, it's like you're, I can never say the word, viewing it as a pathology, that you're pathologizing their income status because you're referring to that, that, fa that child, that family as being their risk factor, as opposed to families that experience risk factors, but they also have strengths. And if and, and so it's a it, it's a very subtle shift in the language that we use, but I think it's really important. And I need to be more um, cognizant of that when I write. Um, I know that like when I did neighborhood research, I was very, you know, people refer to poor neighborhoods um, because it, it seems to pathologize the neighborhood as opposed to, you know, these neighborhoods have strengths. They may be economically challenged, but they're not poor. Um, and the same thing with, you know, children aren't poor. They experience economic challenges at different rates. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Actually, that goes nicely with the next question where someone asked about language. So the question is, I'm hearing presenters use the word diverse, as in diverse children euphemistically in place of non-white. Can we unpack this? It signals that we're still very uncomfortable with calling things as what they are, and it continues to center white as the norm and everyone else different from it. But I think mm -hmm. that really alludes to this use of our language and how we really need to be thoughtful about that. Um, so Eleanor, do you wanna take that one on? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, just to echo what Rebecca said, you know, name your population. I study Black American youth, but if it's white youth, say that. If it's white, Black, and Latino youth, say that. So it's just as simply as saying, these are the youth I study. Um, I understand the use of the word diverse. I try to use ethnically, racially diverse in front of that. But I think the more precise language we can use, the better it is for our science, for our methodologies, for our findings, for interventions. And God bless the intervention people. It's not me today, but God bless you. So again, the more precise we can be with our language, the better our science can be. I, I'm, I'm harping on this point to use racism instead of bias or prejudice, but it all goes back to the same concept, which is that our language needs to be precise as precise as we can make it in everything that we do. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, Rebecca, the next question I have for you is, do you have any recommendations for how PhD students can contribute to anti-racist movement in their departments or universities at large? Oh, great question. Um, so I'm gonna do again, I'm gonna follow up a little bit. So um, I do think in our field that we use diverse to, to mean um, youth of color. Um, but I actually, I'm not using that word in this particular situation in that way, but I, I appreciate being invited to be more specific. Um, when I'm critiquing that we are studying a diverse sample, I actually mean we're studying a, a sample that is heterogeneous on race and ethnicity. And that oftentimes when we study a sample that's heterogeneous on race and ethnicity, we, you know, there are, as, as Margaret's question was um, alluding to earlier, they're under representation. The instrumentation hasn't been developed for work with these specific groups. And much of that, so, so as, a, as a function of some of that, much of this research with diverse youth, what I mean is, sam thank you, samples that are um, heterogeneous on race and ethnicity, do doesn't use, is not um, actually theorizing race, it's colorblind. And so um, I, my, part of my critique is we need, you know, if you're, if you're doing a colorblind research with a sample that is diverse on race and ethnicity, you know, you're, I think we should be responsible for naming that. You know, we did not, you know, and, we didn't address race and ethnicity in a sample that was diverse on race and ethnicity. That's a limitation. Um, and so I want to encourage us and I appreciate. Um, I, yes, I need to say samples that are um, heterogeneous on race and ethnicity. And that doesn't mean that they're representative. Um, I think so. I'm seeing some grad student actions at ASU that I'm really um, proud of right now and really inspired by and um, want to support. Some of those actions are around. Um, holding the university accountable um, for multi for supporting um, multiple race ethnicity uh, students through multicultural centers, um, uh, holding universities accountable relative to policing, um, and on universities and as in many other places um, that we live in, universities are policing both through the active um, engagement of a police force on campus through local um, uh, cooperative agreements with local police forces. But we are also um, policing ideas, and we are policing what gets to be said in the classroom and what doesn't get to be said in the classroom. And I'm seeing students organize around this now, and I'm really inspired by this organization. Um, I also think that there are places within SRCD that students can get involved. I highly recommend the caucuses um, for white students. I, I recommend you know reaching out to scholars like me and Margaret, and especially through the anti-racist white working group. Become involved in that. Say you want to be a student leader in that. Um, these are important spaces. We don't um, you know if we're being mentored by scholars who um, haven't been on these journeys or aren't as far along on these journeys as we need to be, then you need to go out and um, find additional scholars and additional spaces that can nurture your anti-racist anti journey and um, you know, help you to get involved. And then I'll, I'll close by just saying, I always, um, I, I encourage students to get involved. There's a tension, I think, in our, in, our, in our society and in the academy about scholarship and activism and scholar activism. And as a mentor, my goal is to always support students to be the, their authentic version of themselves. And if their authentic version of themselves involves activism and scholarship, then I wanna support that. My goal is to make sure that they're going into those decisions, uh, you know, that I'm mentoring them through the full array of um, risks and rewards associated with those kinds of activities, but to never discourage students from being their authentic selves when it comes to um, addressing racism in their academies and in their scholarship. 
And so I just want to be sure that as white uh, scholars, we're not discouraging that in the name of you need to get your work done. Um, um, yeah, we all need to get our work done, but let's make sure we're just having conversations about how to balance that, how to move forward, how to be your authentic self without squashing um, this very important work that needs to be done. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're going to have a um, question for all, all panelists to sort of conclude um, this. Um, and the, oh gosh, <laughs> this is, sorry, I lost it on my place. What is the one thing that all researchers can immediately do in their labs or at their institutions to help advance an anti-racist scientific agenda? So Margaret, do we all start with you? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great question because I think, like I mentioned before, I think all researchers, whether this is a, an area that you want to extend to into or not, can help to extend this. And I was thinking about it from the perspective of, you know, having a lab and um, and graduate students, because I think a lot of this goes back to training. So thinking about back to my own training when, you know, development was just normative development and it was really there. You could study normative development in white kids or other race ethnicities and development was development. But I think that if if lab directors uh, created some spaces for reading about these things and actively thinking about how these issues may impact the interpretation of their own research, um, even if they're not able to implement, they don't can't have a more diverse sample, ethnically heterogeneous sample in their in their lab that they can start thinking as a as a graduate student how this impacts their work then I think we're going to do a better job training individuals as they're coming up. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, if I were going to do, if, I, if my appetite were sort of, I, I wanted to know more um, after, this, after this webinar, I would recommend um, listening to the podcast Seeing White. It's a multi, season two of Seen on Radio, um, Seeing White podcast. will um, further open your eyes um, on what, on how your, how on our racial history in the United States and on white people's racial history. And once you've listened to that, just look up, pull your head up from your desk and look around you and say, how is whiteness operating in my department right here, right now, as I craft this email, as my director does this or that? Thanks. And Eleanor, before you answer that question, we do have time to sneak in another question for you, which is around how is this agenda, um, an anti-research agenda, apply in cross-cultural or international context? So you can answer that and then give your one tip. Okay, double whammy. Um, the international question is an excellent question. Um, the first thing I recommend, you've got to learn the history of those respective countries. Um, because the history of a country and the way racism manifested historically impacts how it manifests currently. So the history of the United States is different from the history of Brazil, which is different from the history of South Africa, which is different from a place like India, which is different from a place like France. So you need to do your historical homework. What is the history of this particular country? How did racism manifest historically? Was it colonialism? Was it enslavement? Was it genocide? So the first thing to do is to learn the history of that place. Second, I would recommend um, the same emotional labor that we are recommending for white Americans. Majority group members around the world need to do that too. Racism is global. It works 24 hours a day and it's global in scope. So that same homework, while you're learning the history of that place, you also have homework to do. I would also recommend that you partner with indigenous scholars who also, I mean, here's a news flash. Those of us who live oppression, we know more about the oppressor sometimes than they do. So you have a lot to learn from indigenous scholars in your locales if you really want to advance an anti-racist agenda in your specific country. So those would be my recommendations. Learn the history, do your emotional home, emotional labor, homework, intellectual labor, and partner with indigenous scholars in your respective locales or your countries who have lived oppression and have no, have a lot more knowledge about it than someone of the majority group. Now, the one thing I would do, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give you three things, but I, I'm admitting right, right now that I'm cheating. Um, the first thing you can do is wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your social distancing. So somebody's probably texting me, Eleanor, what do the COVID-19 uh, guidelines 
have to do with being anti-racist. Well, COVID-19 is devastating communities like mine. The Native American and the African American communities are being devastated right now because of COVID-19. We know that racism is a pre-existing condition that allows COVID-19 to devastate my communities and indigenous communities. So to the degree that you can reduce, prevent, or altogether eliminate the spread of COVID-19, that is functionally anti-racist in this moment of the pandemic. Second thing, educate yourselves about racism. As Gabby alluded to, I have created a resource list in comments, podcasts, TED Talks, books you can read, movies you can watch, documentaries you can watch, empirical articles. That's just a start. Educate yourself about racism, because I guarantee most people have no idea how this country, United States in particular, is founded in racism. Racism is literally the foundation of this country, and people need to be educated about that. You need to unlearn and relearn the true history of this country, and then understand how racism manifests. The last thing, all right, I see Gabby's giving me the signal. The <laughs> last thing, um, I would recommend, you know, uh, Rebecca and Margaret are, are creating the anti-racist white working group. I think I got that right. And I would recommend that any white person who truly wants to start on this anti-racist journey, you need to build community, community of white people who are anti-racist. Some of Joe Fagan's work indicates that when white people shift into an anti-racist paradigm, they're isolated because they no longer want to affiliate with their family and friends who still adhere to a racist ideology or a racist paradigm. So you need to be intentional now about creating community. There are organizations founded by and run by white people who fight racial injustice. Look up those organizations, join a chapter, but you need to build your community, again, based on the work of Joe Fagan, so that you can anticipate isolation or alienation as you move further in this journey. So those are my three things condensed into one that you can do today. You can observe the COVID-19 deadlines at this moment. Thank you, Eleanor. And I also want to say the Latinx community has also been um, impacted greatly by the uh, COVID-19 um, as well. So it's an important point to raise. I totally agree. Well, that's all the time we have for today, and we must wrap up this conversation. We thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have found it thought-provoking and inspiring. We had a lot of great questions on topics that we weren't able to include today, like teaching and mentorship, and we really want these conversations to continue on, anti on uh, the SRCD Commons community becoming an anti-racist society. Again, we have those resources there, but we also want you to feel comfortable starting new threads on issues and questions that arose for you. You were very engaged in the Q&A, and we want to continue this engagement on SRCD Commons. Um, as is an SRCD, SRCD Commons community. We hope to crowdsource the development of a resource library to help us with our work. So please upload any of the resources that you would believe would be helpful in this work as well. We are sending you a message right now with a direct link to the SRCD Commons, so please check it out. We will also be sending you a link to the video of recording of today's webinar next week. So please feel free to share this with your colleagues who you think might find it useful as well as they go on their own anti-racist journeys. I want to end by sort of thanking Eleanor for bringing this webinar topic up to SRCD leadership, to our two panelists, Rebecca and Margaret, for sharing their expertise and journeys with us today, and to all of you out there listening who logged in um, and want to join us in making the Society for Research and Child Development an anti-racist society. We value your feedback on this conversation, and please fill out the survey after you log off. One thing we really want invite you to do is to sign, if there's things that you think that you want to develop for the society, volunteer and, and reach out to myself or Margaret if you have ideas for future webinars or other ways in which we can continue this conversation in the future. Thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate it, and we want to wish you a good day. <laughs>